Thank you, everyone, for your patience, uh, and thank you for your time, actually, uh, for joining this webinar today. Uh, my name is Nomsa Swanda, and I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at the OR Society. We are delighted today to be joined by Professor Louis Alberto Franco, who will be presenting a webinar on group decision making, uh, opportunities and challenges to policy making. Now, Alberto is currently the Associate Dean at the School of Business and Economics at Loughborough University. Uh, he has extensive uh, consulting experience in health, transport, construction, government, and defense, where he has led projects to support strategic management, value-focused thinking, risk analysis, and resource allocation. A number of organizations that he has worked for include uh, Whitbread, Bombardier, Network Rail, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of the Department of Environment, Environment sorry, and the World Health Organization. Uh, I'm just going to run through a few um, housekeeping elements before we start. Uh, so this webinar is going to be recorded and slides will be available after the webinar. Uh, this is the first time that we're using the Zoom platform uh, based on feedback that a lot of people who are in um, government organizations were not able to access our previous webinars. So this has a online only feature, which hopefully means that more people will be able to join in future. And additionally, uh, Alberta today is gonna present a quite interactive uh, webinar. So please stay tuned and there may be some poll questions where we'd like to engage with you all. And right now I am, oh, and in terms of questions, um, Alberta is gonna answer any questions right at the end, but please feel free to use the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions throughout the webinar and those will be answered right at the end. So now I'm going to pass over straight to Alberto and you can take it away. Thank you, Nomsa. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have to admit that this is uh, the first time I'm doing a webinar. Um, I'm used to uh, sessions where I, I interact face to face with uh, participants, but um, I'm gonna have a go, so uh, be patient with me, please. Let me just start um, this presentation with um, with a story. Um, let me see if I can, if I can. Um, ah, it is <laughs> it is frozen. I cannot go to the next page, Nomsa. What do I do? Oh no! <laughs> no, no. Um, right. I'm trying this to. This is not making for, for a great first experience of a webinar. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Let me see if I can do it again. I can see it there. Yes, thank you. I don't know what happened there, but let me start with this, with this story. Um, during much of the late 1990s um, in Holland, the Dutch prison services was faced with a shortage, shortage of prison capacity. Uh, in about 2000, uh, prisoners serving time for less serious crimes uh, and who had completed more or less 90% of their sentence were made eligible for early release. And, and three years later, this figure was uh, decreased to 70%. So if you have completed 70% of your sentence, you could, get, get, uh, you could be uh, you know, available for or accessible to uh, get early release. And, and what happened as a consequence of that decision is that uh, this increased the number of prisoners released dramatically from 200 prisoners released in early 2000s to 400, 500 people or uh, uh, prisoners in 2001 and about 5,000 uh, prisoners in 2002. And this policy of early release was successful in solving the problem of prison capacity, obviously, because they had a shortage of capacity uh, in the prison services. However, what it also did was created problems elsewhere in the Dutch Criminal Justice Administration because judges noted that several people they had recently convicted and imprisoned for an earlier crime were reappearing in court. Uh, and they recognized some suspects as individuals that they had seen earlier and who in fact should be still serving their sentences. So what they do, because they were concerned, the judges basically what they did is um, they, to compensate, they started to pass longer sentences to both old and new offenders. And so the short-term effect of the judge's action uh, was to increase the demand for prison capacity, which went against the goal of uh, solving the, the, the capacity problem. And, uh, and what I wanted to notice is that this is a good example of a, a problem which um, we call a messy problem. And it's a messy problem because uh, uh, there are a number of problems that are all interconnected. You're trying to solve one aspect of a problem 
and then you're creating problems elsewhere. And the thing is that local solutions don't necessarily solve the overall problem. When we have problems like this um, in policy settings, interconnectedness is a, a, a key characteristic. Um, not only interconnectedness, of course, but also uncertainty, because obviously uh, the, the prison services didn't know what the judges were going to do. Uh, you don't know what the levels of crime are going to be in the future. You don't know what the impact of uh, extending the sentences is going to be. So there are not only uncertainties about the environment, but also uncertainties about what John Friend uh, used to call uncertainties about related decisions or related uh, agendas. So uh, um, how do you, uh, uh, you know, sort of address problems like this? Well, uh, Paul Nutt is a pro retired professor from the University of Ohio in the United States. And they, he did a study, um, a 30 year program, uh, studying decisions in organizations of different, uh, different levels. So uh, he studied uh, uh, 400 complex decisions in the private, public and non-for-profit sectors in the US, in Canada and in Europe. And uh, one of the things that he found is that when you have complex problems like this, uh, what people tend to do are two things. One is that they try to persuade others to support their point of view and gathering arguments that favor the, the preferred option. Or they used to uh, uh, circulate a, a directive explaining why they were doing what they were doing. Uh, and so decide and persuade was sort of the most common tactics or tactics that um, Paul not found in his research. But he also found that these two tactics didn't work. Uh, most of the time. Uh, and one of the reasons why um, these uh, tactics don't work is because uh, um, um, people tend to sort of uh, um, uh, uh, assume that complex problems and policy problems are actually uh, problems that are technical in nature. Uh, Keith Green is a professor of leadership at Warwick Business School, and he makes this distinction between team problems and policy problems. Um, the, what he argues is, is that uh, what we tend to do is we tend to tame problems all the time. And why do we tend to tame problems all the time? Because tame problems usually are well defined and they have a solution. They have an optimal solution. Most of the time, there, there are problems that have happened before. And, and, and the role of, of the policymaker is to basically find the optimal solution to that problem. Whereas policy problems are a bit more complex because their definition is, is, is contested. Um, people see the problem from different angles, different aspects of the problem. Usually any solution to, the, to, to a problem that is a policy problem will create problems elsewhere. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Uh, think about crime, global warming. Uh, think about uh, the NHS. Those are settings where Obviously, there will be better responses uh, to the situation, but uh, they are not necessarily uh, optimal solutions by any means. And the difference, as I said, is that Keith Green suggests that if you have a tame problem, you know, the role is to provide appropriate solution, the optimal solution. But if you have a policy problem, what you need to do is to facilitate a, a collaboration, a problem solving collaboration. You need to involve a number of stakeholders to think about how to address best that policy problem. Now, if that is the case, then perhaps the only thing that we need to do is to involve a number of people, get the right people in the room, and just think about how to, to address a policy problem. And uh, let me tell you another story. I was involved in a project many years ago with the London Borough of Newham. Um, the, there, there was um, a, a strategy, a teenage, teenage pregnancy strategy group which uh, was uh, made of representatives from the borough and the NHS, uh, you know, uh, voluntary groups, you know, parent support groups. And they wanted to, uh, they, their remit was how to manage, control and reduce the number of teenage pregnancies in the area. And, uh, and they had, you know, very, very, um, you know, capable and competent people in this group. Nevertheless, they find it extremely difficult to get an agreement about what was the best way of addressing that particular situation. Uh, and, and so um, even though uh, with a policy problem, uh, we, will, uh, we will need to uh, sort of uh, facilitate or lead a collaboration uh, or a problem solving collaboration, uh, uh, doing that is not necessarily easy. Um, and there are challenges and I'm going to mention three challenges in particular. 
um, that make policy problems uh, and, and sort of uh, 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 the, the process of, of solving policy problems or addressing policy problems in a group setting difficult and challenging. Mm -hmm. And one is the orientation uh, uh, that we adopt in terms of uh, 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 solving or addressing the, the problem. And let me let me let me uh, give you an example. Um, um, I am going to give you uh, a little a little exercise to do uh, from your from your laptops. Um, let's say that we have two coins. There are two pound coins there. They are different, uh, but they obviously value the, uh, the same. Is going one and coin two, and um, let's assume that uh, we have a lottery that we can play with coin one. Uh, if if you throw or toss the coin uh, once, uh, and if it lands on heads, then you get a prize of twenty thousand pounds. But if if it, if it lands on on tails, then you get nothing. That's one situation. There is another alternative lottery with coin two where. You can also, uh, you know, throw it once. If it lands on heads, uh, you get you get twenty thousand pounds. If it lands on tails, you get nothing. Well, where's the catch? Well, the catch is that the the coins are biased, and uh, so the first coin is biased towards tails. So it has only a forty-five chance that it will land on on a head, uh, whereas coin two is biased towards heads. So it has a fifty-five chance present uh, that is going to land on, on, on head. So my question to you would be, uh, for example, you know, which coin would you, uh, would you choose? And when I ask this question to people, most people choose coin two. And, and, and let's assume that you are in that group of people who are choosing coin two, and then you decide to play the lottery. And so you toss the coin once, um, and it lands in, in tails, and then you will get nothing in that case. So um, let's say for the sake of our room and you're thinking, well, what would it happen if I toss coin one instead? And let's say that I'll give you the opportunity to do that. And then um, you, um, you toss coin one to see what happens. You do it and, and, and you get a heads. So you, know, you would have won 20,000 uh, pounds. So my question to you is this, um, was choosing coin two a good decision? A bad decision? So was it a good decision? Yes or no? That's what I'm, we're gonna do a little poll here with you guys and see what happens. Was, it, was, was choosing coin two a good decision? Yes or no? Let's see. Okay, so everyone should currently see the poll uh, right now running, so Simply put in your answer, yes or no, and please click submit. So we've got almost everyone uh, voting now. I think we're about halfway through. Is everyone? Okay, that's still going up. As I said earlier, there should be a poll that should be on your screen uh, if you select your chosen answer and then click yes or no. All right, I think that should be just about enough time. So I'm just gonna close that poll now. Okay. And I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so yes, it's it's a it's a good decision. Um, Eighty-eight uh, percent. No, uh, is about thirteen percent. So, so I I like I like to to ask a question, uh, and please feel free to to send some comments. Uh, for those who said yes, was it, it was a good decision? Can you tell me why in a couple of in a couple of with a couple of words, you know, or maybe just a short sentence? And then I'll I'll, I'll read out some of these answers here. Okay, perfect. And so the best way for everyone to answer those questions is using the Q&A button. So if you just put in your answer in there and then Alberto will be able to read out some of those. So 
Since we don't have any answers as yet, maybe we have a, a shy audience. That's okay. That's okay. I can. I can. <laughs> I can, I can, ah, okay. I can. Yeah. coming through now. Right. How do I see them? Uh, so if you just click on the Q and A uh, section at the bottom, or it should be at the top for you actually. Oh yeah, at the top, yes. Uh, oh yes. All yeah, right. So you have like a, a number on the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see one of the participants don't want to answer. That's good. Um, so uh, there's one answer here. The decision was a good one. The outcome is not the decision, which, which is interesting. The decision towards yes was based on the initial information, not the new information after touching the coin. I think that's, that's fair enough. I think most, most people would say that you're taking that decision uh, based on the, on the information that you have at the time, and that was the best information uh, that you have. Um, and and that, that, is, that is fine. Um, and, and my question, um is is now uh how do i go oh yes we are we are trying to actually contrast a sort of a, a logical process that you are following with, with with a bad outcome but you know in this case the majority uh, would think uh, well you know i had the best information possible at the time and I, I made the right choice but there were some people that were, were actually thinking the opposite and i wonder whether it's because of this i was wondering how you evaluate the quality of your decisions? Do you evaluate the quality of your decisions in terms of the process you follow to make the decision or in terms of, of the outcome? You know, personally or in your team or in your organization, how do you judge the quality of a decision? Is the outcome or is the process? Can we have a poll for that just to have a, 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 a feel for where do people stand on this? Do you evaluate the quality of your decisions in terms of the process or the outcome? Okay, I'm just going to give that poll a few more seconds, but it seems like most people who are active online would have answered that. So I am going to close the poll shortly. Okay. Yep, I'm closing that and sharing the results. The process and the outcome is interesting um, because uh, I, I would really like to... Uh, to, to encourage those people to, at some point, it won't be possible through these, these means, but um, um, the people are, are judging the process. I wonder how many organizations actually incentivize, you know, uh, their members by, uh, um, 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 you know, rewarding the process of, of decision making. I think it, it is indeed uh, uh, the process, the only thing that we can control. Uh, rather than the outcome, and yet we would find that probably many organizations uh, would actually look, uh, if not at both, we definitely look at, at the result as well. Let me let me uh, move forward. Um, ideally, if you if you have a bad process, you should you should you know have a bad outcome, and if you have a good process, you should lead to a, to a good outcome. But in reality, the distinction is not clear, particularly when the result you know, is uh, far ahead in, in time. So yes, a good process should lead to a good outcome, but the outcome cannot be always controlled. When I was uh, working many, many years ago in Strathclyde University, I worked uh, with Colin Eden and his team, and they were working on a, on a, on a project uh, just before I, I, I joined Strathclyde uh, with Bombardier, where they were looking at um, um, the, 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 the sort of the issues that disruption and delay would cause in, in complex projects. And they, would, they were looking at, in particular, a channel tunnel project. And, uh, and one of the things that they discover is that it is really the effect of decisions, you know, and the delay of their impact that actually cause problems in, in, in the results of the project. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what uh, basically they, 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 they illustrate, you know, um, uh, uh, with this, this this graph, what happens when 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 behavior is 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 in place? So if they had a, a very 
large project and there is a disruption, uh, the engineer thinks or the manager thinks that there will be a delay in the project uh, and the delivery of the project. And if that is the case, then one decision could be to work over time to sort of compensate for that perceived or expected delay. Uh, if you work over time, you're going to increase productivity, and then you can ensure that the project will progress and then the expected delay will be reduced. And that's the way you can control it. Having said that, what happens uh, uh, is that sometimes if you do too much over time, people can get fatigued, they can make mistakes, which means that they have to do rework, which means that the progress of the project gets impact negatively, which means that the delay will come up again. Uh, and so if that happens, then another way, what Colin Eden and his team discovered is another way of trying to reduce the delay is to put pressure on people. And if you put pressure on people, you increase the work rate, increase productivity, the progress increases, and, and also the delay diminishes. But uh, that also causes mistakes, which cause rework and project progress gets impacted and etc. So, and at the end, too much pressure also diminishes morale. If it diminishes morale, the work rate is affected, productivity gets affected and so on. So in the end, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the, the, um, the, the link between the process of making a choice and the actual outcome, you know, when time is involved and the result is not immediate, can actually get more complex. And so uh, an outcome, it is influenced by the process, but it's also influenced by what people do and also obviously by, by chance and uncertainty. Right. Nevertheless, having said that, because of that, the only thing that you can control still is the process. You can't control the outcome necessarily. And the best you can do to guarantee a, a good outcome is to have a good decision process. And going back to the research that Paul Nutt did in his 30 year program, uh, one of the findings of that piece of work was that uh, an effective decision process, and this is an empirical evidence, an effective decision process increases the chances of implementation success by 50%. Uh, and and that, that was the case for all types of decisions, no matter how important, how urgent, the level of the decision, who took the decision, uh, the level of initial support resource. In all cases, that was the, 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 the striking finding. So process, it is important. And, um, and our orientation towards process uh, rather than outcome is something that um, we need to uh, bear in mind when we're dealing with particularly complex, complex problems. Um, the other challenge, uh, it, it tends to be with, with cognitive traps. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, research in, in psychology, and particularly in behavioral economics, that talks about the, the traps in which we fall sometimes because of uh, our limitations in terms of being, uh, you know, inf uh, processing information, but also traps in which we can fall within a group setting when we're making decisions. Uh, let, me, let me give you uh, another, another example. In a moment, I'm going to show you four cards uh, that in the game. And I want you to make a note of the cards that you're going to see, okay? Uh, but I'm going to show you this very, very briefly. Literally, I'm gonna show it to you for four seconds. So you have to sort of pay attention to what you see. I'm gonna count until four and then you're gonna stop. And then I'm gonna ask you what you saw, okay? So um, write down the names of the cards in a piece of paper. And then, and then I'm gonna ask you what you saw. Uh, if you're ready, we'll do it now. And in this case, don't worry, you, you don't have a neighbor, I assume, so um, it, it's fine, forget about the last bullet point. So I'm going to show you the cards now for four seconds. Right. Now, I will, I, I'm, um, Nomsa is gonna, is gonna make a poll, it's gonna tell you uh, what the cards were and what, um, how many of you saw um, those cards? So how many saw the Ace of Hearts, the Nine of Clubs, the Seven of Diamonds, and the Queen of Spades?
Okay, I think it looks like everyone has voted for that. So I'm just going to close the poll now and then share the results. Okay, so uh, the Ace of Hearts, um, almost 90% of you have seen it. The Nine of Clubs, again, 56%. You know, Seven of Diamonds, about 70%. Queen of Spades, 56%. Well, thank you very much. That's very, very good. I would like to show you now what you saw. And even though I show you this very briefly, a good, a good proportion of you guys have actually so have to seen the, the Queen of Spades. But as you can see, there's no Queen of Spades there. There's a Queen of Hearts, but the hearts are black. And, and what's the point? Well, the point is um, that um, what, what we are expecting in that situation is because we've seen cards before, we're expecting to see the Queen of Spades. It was black. It looked more or less like space, and why not? And so um, those those expectations, in a way, will inform you know what we see and what we not see. Now, uh, expectations, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to cards is one thing, but expectations when it comes to problem solving and decisions is a different thing. And usually, our expectations uh, will get developed throughout time through our expertise, our organizational roles, uh, the type of you know personality we have. So what problems to solve and how to solve them will be all underpinned by what we see and what we don't see. And what we see or not see depends on the frames we use to understand a situation. And what, what do I mean by frames? Frames you know, uh, it, it are, are the things that we use in our heads to simplify and guide our understanding of what we, we see as reality. And they force us you know, to see problems and decisions in particular ways. And, and the first thing that we can think about is that, you know, if you're an accountant, you probably will see, you know, problems and decisions from an accountant point of view. If you're an engineer, you will see it from an engineering point of view. If you're a lawyer from a lawyer's point of view, that's, 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 that's natural. It happens. Uh, but the, the important thing is that the frames that we use, they simplify, you know, our understanding of problems and, and, and decision problems in particular. So uh, it is like being, Im imagine that you are in the countryside, in, in, in the UK and you're inside this, this, this wonderful manor that has many, many windows and you want to picture how the landscape looks like and then you go through a window, you choose a particular window and you see part of the countryside. If you go to a different window, you're gonna see another part of the countryside. You're never gonna, you have to imagine the whole picture, the whole landscape, but you can only see a, a limited version of it. So the frames we choose will influence what we see or expect to see, as in the, case, in, in the previous case. And, and that will inform your future, your future action. And this is an example that I've taken from uh, a book called Making Strategy, which is an interesting example, because basically it says, even when we think that we agree about how we are seeing the world, we might actually are using, we might be using different frames to understand the same, the same situation. So let's imagine that you have two people uh, in an organization, Two colleagues, both colleagues agree that one of the issues that you have is that we need to increase motivation, you know, of, of staff, and that's the problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, and they seem to be in agreement. Nevertheless, if you ask person A, why do you think we need to increase motivation? Uh, that person might say, well, you know, if we get motivated people, then we will, you know, uh, reduce errors that actually they they they, they commit and probably de deliberate errors as well. Not only that. If we have motivated people, we can increase the speed of service, which is something that we want to achieve. Um, if, if you ask person B, so why do you think we need to increase motivation? Well, for person B, it's a bit different because person B thinks that motivated staff will be more creative. And if you are more creative, then um, uh, you will also uh, retain you know, uh, the best staff because they are motivated. And why that matters? That matters because the, the, the way they are seeing the same situation imply different solutions. That's why it matters. So for person A, uh, one solution could be to improve the work environment so that to make them more motivated or to pay them more. Uh, whereas for person B, perhaps the way to motivate people is not about money, it's about recognition because uh, you know, highly creative people need recognition, but also provide them opportunities to, of, of career paths within the organization. That's gonna keep them motivated. So, 
apparently the same problem, but different solutions. Why? Because the frames that these people are using are very, very different. You know? Now, um, again, um, uh, this is a good example. You know, some of you will be able to see the duck. Some of you will be able to see the rabbit. Uh, what your brain probably is doing, you know, is it, it, it sees the duck first, then it clicks and it switches to, to the rabbit and so on. Some problem policy problems probably are neither duck nor rabbit, but they're probably a combination of both. But the point is that once you choose what to see, that will guide your future action. And so um, being aware of what frames are you using is important from the start. And one example of how frames are not managed well is the Challenger um, story. You probably remember that in 1986, uh, the Challenger exploded after 86 seconds of um, having actually um, been launched. Um, this, uh, this particular uh, mission was famous because of that woman, Krista McAuliffe. She was a teacher and this mission was part of a very um, high profile project called Teacher in Space. Uh, and the idea was that this teacher, which, well, well, she was a sort of a civil, she, was, she wasn't really an astronaut, but she was going to go into into space and she was going to teach from space. That was part of the, the, the project. And, uh, um, and anyway, I think what happened in there, um, in the night before the launch, um, NASA and, and their supplier, uh, Morton Cycle, uh, are the, the sort of the engineers who uh, produce the, the boosters that go attached to the, to the, to the Challenger so that you can you know, uh, propel it to, into space. Uh, and um, they had a teleconference call to discuss the issue of launching the shuttle or not. Uh, the suppliers, Morton Cycle, who was the contractor, as I said, in charge of the shuttle's rocket boosters, they had concerns that low temperatures would prevent the, the shuttle boosters' O rings from sealing and therefore uh, uh, le leading to leakage of hot gases. And, uh, the evidence that the, you know, the temperature would affect the performance of these O-rings uh, was not really uh, very conclusive. And all parties want to sort of solve that, that issue, but uh, obviously uh, NASA wanted to launch the, uh, the, the shuttle. Uh, Thornton, Mike, uh, Thornton and Morton Cycle didn't want to launch because they were concerned about the temperature. Uh, at the end, they had opposite positions. And the interesting bit is that there was a report about the, that decision-making process, the Presidential Commission of the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. And in that report, what, what it says is that the way NASA framed the situation was that the, uh, the, the default option was, we're going to launch unless you prove us that there's something wrong <coughs> with the O-rings. And so once, once you frame the situation in that way, it's very difficult to actually explore alternative frames. It's similar to when Bush uh, decided to um, um, to go um, um, on war to to Afghanistan after um, um, uh, this, the the tower um, the twin towers uh, you know um, terrorist attacks. Um, Bush said very clearly they they declare war on us, so we have a war you know to to, to follow and you know uh, the, the next de decision to be made is what's the best way to go to war, but it was never going to war or not going to war. It was, we're going to war from the start because they declare war on us. So how do you frame a situation from the start will, will sort of a <coughs> and fix what you do, what you do next. Uh, um, I am going to um, ask you one more thing. Um, this, is a, this is a painting. Some of you may know about this painting. Some of you may not know. So, um, I am not really an expert in art. Uh, so when I go to a uh, um, uh, an art exhibition, I always very find uh, I find very helpful to read sort of the little notes that are next to these um, these paintings to understand what the uh, the artist um, was was thinking about when they were doing their their, their art. And so um, let's imagine that you are in a in a gallery in an art gallery and you see this, this painting, and, and you're trying to read what the painting is about, but the, the information, you know, the little plate uh, is, is missing. So if I ask you to give a title to this 
piece of art to this painting, you know, assuming that you don't know what the painting is, can you give a title to this? And, and, and if I can ask you to just write it down in your Q&A, if you can write a title, any title, the title that this sort of uh, inspires you. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll read some of those aloud. Can we read those? Uh, yes, uh, so it will be the same as earlier. So at the top of your screen, you should be able to Please. see the Q&A section. Just yep. click on that. Yep. Okay, then. So the calm before the storm, nice. Field, nice. Field of corn, nice. Okay, excellent. Thank you for, for that. I think, uh, uh, you know, summertime, excellent. So there are some, some titles which describe exactly what you see in other titles, perhaps a little bit more poetic, and they're all obviously <clears throat> uh, all right, or all fine, they're, they're excellent. Um, but if, if, if I give you um, an extra piece of information, for example, allegedly, this was the last painting that Van Gogh actually painted before he killed himself, before he committed suicide. So if I told you that information, would you have changed the title? Uh, would you have changed summertime for something different? Would you have changed fear for something different? If you did, if you would change the title because of that information, that, that would mean in your case that context would matter for you. And, uh, and, and this is, uh, there you go. Uh, this is important because when you see a, a problem, or, or, or a decision problem to, to, to be addressed, uh, the meaning that you give to the context will matter and the meaning will change, you know, uh, depending on, on, on who you are asking you know, the question. Um, and it, it is important not only to understand how people are interpreting the context of a problem, but also uh, it is important to understand how people are giving meaning to others about what they are seeing or not seeing in terms of that, that context. Okay. So um, frames are just one of the things that we use to understand problems and to uh, um, sort of produce solutions. They are, they're, they're, they're just one of those things that if we're not aware of our frames, we might fall on a, on a trap uh, because we, uh, I think the problem with frames is that if the frame is too narrow, then, then you're gonna have a narrow set of solutions or, or responses to, to the problem. And uh, there are a number of other sort of uh, traps that you can fall into uh, and the research, uh, the, the best sort of a source uh, of research on cognitive traps is, is the, the book by uh, Kahneman uh, on, on thinking fast and slow. Uh, you know, uh, traps in which, for example, if we are looking for a particular solution uh, to a problem, uh, we try to find information that confirms, you know, what we want to uh, uh, sort of propose. Uh, you know, sort of a confirmation bias, um, uh, the fact that when we are providing estimates, we are perhaps anchoring on values and providing very narrow ranges and that sort of stuff. So, you know, we need to be aware of the, you know, the things that we are using, how we're thinking, how we're processing information uh, when we are dealing with a, with a problem. And that will affect not only what we do, but also the process that we adopt to, to, to solve a, a problem or to, or to make a decision in a, in a, in a, in a policy environment and, and as a team. And that obviously will impact on the outcome. And the last bit that I wanted to mention in terms of challenges is, uh, you know, when we are operating in a team, there is likely to be dysfunctional dynamics. And they come basically from the fact that if, if we are dealing with a complex problem, people will have different views about how to solve, what the problem is in the first place and how to solve it. And uh, there will be some conflict of ideas, our perspectives. They are not necessarily, it is not necessarily bad that there is conflict. In fact, uh, you need to have some tensions uh, there in order to, to sort of, uh, to explore different possibilities and to be creative. There is research and evidence, and evidence that suggests that, you know, conflict 
of the cognitive type actually makes us more creative and makes us more sharp in terms of our ideas and, and in terms of how we analyze the situation. But the problem is that when we are dealing with complex situations and we, we have very different ideas about how to proceed, uh, we can get from cognitive conflict into sort of affective or personal conflict. And when the disagreement becomes personal, then that's when you have an issue because people will become defensive, they might not share their best ideas, they might not reveal all the information that matters. And, and that, that usually you know, can happen in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, when the data is, you know, that you have is limited or is ambiguous, when you have strongly different values or beliefs about what's best in that particular situation. And you know, the, the example of the challenger that I mentioned before is a great example of how conflict was badly managed because um, apparently with this report of the Presidential Commission of the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident, uh, what they say in this report is that NASA managers tried to win the argument at all costs. They presented their views very forcefully. They were suppressing you know, dissenters. They were seeing the other party as an opponent. And so they moved from cognitive conflict to affective conflict very, very, very rapidly. And that, that didn't help you know, them to understand the arguments of the, of the supplier in this case. You can though understand why they were so adamant to change their mind in terms of launching the, 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 the rocket. Because if you, if you, if you look at this, this, this graph, that graph shows you the number of uh, failures that the O-rings have in the past against the temperature, okay? And the argument was, the argument of the supplier was, if there's lower temperatures, <coughs> we're gonna have more uh, failures. And if there's higher temperatures, we're gonna have less failures. So the day of the lunch, the temperatures were going to be very low and they were concerned that we would have more failures. But if you look at this graph, there's no a clear correlation between temperature and failure. And one of the reasons why this data doesn't help is because it's very limited. And as I said before, the, 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 fra the initial frame, you know, the default frame was we are launching unless you prove me, prove me otherwise, but they couldn't prove it otherwise. And, and they, were, they, were, they, they, they were, you know, in a situation where the conflict was very high, stakes were very high. Now, if you look at this, these are the, the, the flights in which there were uh, actually um, uh, failures. But uh, if you would have plotted, you know, those flights in which there was no failures in the past, then it would have been perhaps a little bit more persuasive. They are that if you have higher temperatures, you have less chances of having a failure. But of course, they couldn't see this because when you are in a heated debate and when, you know, the parties are seeing each other as opponents, and one is framing the situation in a fixed way, you, you, you don't really have the space to think and perhaps to explore alternative ways of addressing the same situation. And this data, they did have it because all the people, all the relevant people were, were actually there. Okay, so what are then, if those are the challenges, what are the opportunities for policymakers and in particular policy analysts, because I'm thinking this is a, a webinar for, for the OR society. So I'm assuming that many of the participants here are, are analysts. So um, there are five important choices that you can, you can think of in terms of addressing some of the challenges that I've been uh, discussing so far. Uh, the, first, the first choice is, is, is the bias in tools. There are many, many uh, the bias in tools available that you can use to sort of understand you know, the frames, for example, that you're using in a, in, in a particular problem situation or in a particular decision problem. And you know, many of the, uh, the, the family of problem structuring methods, for example, available, uh, help you to understand how people frame a problem and, and appreciate the different understandings of, of, of a problem. So there's just one, one, one example of device and tools, but just being aware of uh, other people's frames and potential biases and heuristics is, 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 a good, is a good step forward in this direction. The second choice, of course, is <clears throat> to have the, the right people in the, in the room to, to address the problem or the decision. So, you know, having, having the right, the best people with the best expertise and the best knowledge is important. But um, not only that, we also have to pay attention to not only those who have the expertise and knowledge, but also those who will 
help us to, uh, uh, to implement the, the eventual solution, or, or perhaps those who uh, will, will resist the solution, they will have to be involved somehow in the team. The third uh, um, choice that is important is to, to agree on how people will be able to engage in the discussion about the problem or the, or the decision. So uh, are people going to be allowed to debate openly uh, you know, uh, um, and, and disagree openly with, with, with the members of the team or, or not? Um, and there is um, um, evidence that um, um, if people feel that they can risk to disagree, uh, you know, better solutions can be found uh, in, in the team. There is a concept called uh, psychological safety, which is uh, when, when it's high, uh, uh, people are more, more, more likely to debate openly about the different issues that are, are important in a particular situation. Uh, the research um, that uh, has been led by uh, Harvard professor uh, Amy Edmondson uh, talks a, a lot about um, achieving high levels of psychological safety in teams and teams who feel uh, you know uh, that they have high levels of psychological safety they are more willing to debate openly disagree and explore different frames um, so the mode of interaction is is very important the fourth uh, choice obviously is the, the method that you're going to use to um, to to make the decision in a, in a team setting um, we can have a structured approaches to to make decisions we can have a consensus or unstructured approaches as well and there are advantages and disadvantages you know the, the unstructured approach the idea is that you know also known as consensus approach um, and it is it is uh, preferred in many situations because you get to solutions where everybody agree the problem is when you have unstructured approaches, you can converge too early to a solution and you can miss perhaps better um, responses or better alternatives. Uh, structured approaches uh, like those we use, that are used uh, you know, within, within the, the, the discipline of operational research obviously have been designed to uh, force us to think about very carefully about the assumptions that we're making, the frames that we're using, uh, and the, the information that we're using, etc. But and the 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 cost is 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 high because it is effort. People sometimes need to be trained, uh, and it takes time. So so again, we have to make a decision about that. And the last one is is the degree of of control that you, you want to have in the process. If one is a policy analyst, he needs to understand to which to which to which extent um, uh, the policy analyst wants to be directive in terms of directing the process. Uh, um, and you know, uh, contributing to content or not, uh, uh, or or leave the process a little bit more of a in a less fair um, manner, you know, and, and leave people to just uh, uh, get on with the problem by themselves. That that is a choice, and it has advantages and disadvantages. And it's the same with with the client or who the problem the problem owner is. Um, they will have to make a decision uh, whether um, the problem owner will will announce preferences about particular solutions up front or will wait until the end until you know the team has has finished uh, um, sort of addressing the problem and providing a recommendation if one announces you know a preferred direction from the beginning that in a way will frame uh, the process in a particular direction and people may feel that um, the decision has already been made um, what is important is to to make the process on, on, on the roadmap of the process clear to people and, and that, that again is, is a choice. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, you know, it's important to focus on the process um, because there are many things that affect the process uh, and, and, and the outcome ultimately um, and there are choices that we can make in terms of cognitive traps, there are the biasing tools in terms of the process itself who, who participates, uh, the rules of the game, what method we use to evaluate different options and the degree of control that we have over the process. They are all choices open to policy analysts in this particular setting. Um, and with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll finish there. And if you have any questions in the next five, six minutes, I'm very, very happy to, to take them. 
Thank you so much, uh, Alberta. And I'm sure everyone will join me in um, thanking Alberta for such a great and insightful presentation. Uh, lots to think about there, definitely. Uh, as he just mentioned, we still have a few minutes for any questions. So as usual, please use the Q&A section uh, to send any questions that you may have. And whilst we do that, I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that uh, these slides uh, will be available after the presentation. I'll probably send them out tomorrow, um, as well as the recording, uh, so you don't have to miss out, and you can also share with your uh, friends and colleagues as well. Uh, in terms of our next webinar, uh, that's going to happen on the 5th of December. Um, and we'll be sending out all those details, um, but they'll also be available on our website and all the usual channels. So you can see those on inside of our, um, a lot of our events email, as well as our website and social media. So keep an eye out for those. Okay. <clears throat> I think we've got one question now, um, which says the participants of the decision conference might have different framings. Is there a mean to deal with all the framings once at the same time? Well, um, it is. I mean, th there are choices there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in a decision conference, conference um, uh, um, you, you will have people with different framings. And they are on on the one hand, you know, those frame those different framings can be discussed earlier in the process. Um, you can use a, 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 a sort of a, a an instructor approach to it, just discussing them openly. And those who are very skilled skill facilitators can actually make you know people aware of the different frames that are being discussed in place. But uh, if you want to use a, a more structured approach, then there are a number of tools uh, in which we can basically see the frames that are being discussed, uh, um, you know, in, in front of in front of the of the group. Uh, problem structuring methods are, you know, very very um, uh, uh, useful for that. Um, you can use uh, causal or cognitive mapping as a means to understand the different frames that people are using to understand the problem. Uh, uh, the, 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 the advantage of using mapping is because you can use colors and, and, and you can understand the logic of the frame because you are connecting ideas you know, uh, with cause and effect um, um, links. But there are other, other um, problem structuring methods that can be used uh, to understand the different frames. You know, when you, you apply uh, the ideas from subsystem methodology, for example, some of the, uh, the the tools like the cat pool for example tool is good understanding to, under, to 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 see you know the root definitions to understand the different alternative root definitions of a particular system that once somebody wants to to address or or improve and again the different root definitions will 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 depend on the frame that you're actually using great thank you for that and a quick uh, follow-up uh, to that question uh, says do you mean that prior interviews and other soft OR methods are recommended? Yes, I, I think uh, if there is time to do prior interviews to understand the different framings, by all means, by all means, you know, I would suggest that. Uh, sometimes time time is an issue, and, and interviews are not possible. So you have you have to do that as part of a workshop design and do it in the workshop. But of course, it is more demanding, takes more time depends on the size of the group. But if you have time to do interviews and get a sense of the frames before, uh, uh, you know, at, at the team meeting, then yeah, by all means. Perfect. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you for the questions that were uh, submitted so far and to everyone for actually participating in this. And finally, thank you to you, Alberto, for this brilliant presentation. And we look forward to you joining us for the uh, next one, which will be in December. Okay. Thank you very much uh, to all of you guys. And 
I am a web webinar sort of a presented version, really. I've never done this before, so thank you for your patience. Thanks. No, great job. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.